Good morning, everyone. Uh, now we are going to have a talk about a topic that I really think is important, not only for Portugal where we are, but worldwide, which is sustainable jobs. And to be here with us today, we have Christopher Story from Sea Shepherd. Uh, and Christopher is also co-founder of Ager Impact, director of Sea Shepherd Portugal, and head of innovation at Green Innovation Group. With a degree in communication and media studies, Christopher's mission is to create impact, help people and the planet. We also have with us uh, Frederick Van Der, so we are trying to connect him, hopefully, uh, from the Green Innovation Group. He is an anthropologist and entrepreneur with expertise in impact and innovation in business and CEO of the Green Innovation Group. He advises corporates and governments on green innovation and, we've, uh, and his organization has more than 6,000 green innovations mapped and activities on three continents. And our third speaker is Nuno Brito Giorgi. Uh, and he was the co-founder and CEO of GoParity, an investment platform that promotes sustainable projects by facilitating access to new ethical opportunities while sharing its benefits with everyone. An entrepreneur and enthusiast of innovation and sustainability, Nuno uh, is motivated by the power of collaboration for change and he strives to create a world where money is used for good. Thank you very much and we would like to start with Christopher. Hello, good morning. So thank you, first of all, for having me. Uh, I don't know if Frederick is joining us, so I think I will start about um, Green Innovation Group. Uh, so Green Innovation Group connects green technologies, uh, startups and SMEs with investors, uh, corporates, uh, municipalities, and so on. Uh, from my experience with Green Innovation Group, we hire a lot of interns uh, from worldwide. Uh, and that made me then form Azure Impact. Uh, Azure Impact is a, a platform that connects young students with impact jobs. So we have around 25 jobs uh, worldwide right now. Uh, many of them are internships, volunteering jobs, uh, and full-time jobs. Uh, and yeah, basically we connect them with impact uh, NGOs and, and corporates and startups uh, worldwide. Uh, we work with major universities in Portugal, France, UK, Holland, and so on. And yeah, this has been going for about a year. Uh, and I formed this actually with some interns that I worked with at Green Innovation Group. So that was a quite a nice story that now they are board members uh, and founders of Azure Impact. But Azure Impact in, to in, in total is a, is, a, is a platform for impact projects. So we also have uh, Ghost Network. Uh, and Ghost Network is an is a amazing project that we're working together with the municipal of Setubal, uh, the port of Setubal, and Doko Pesca. And the aim of Ghost Network is to collect ghost nets, which are discarded fishing gear from fishermen, and turn them into products. So we're working with uh, local and international startups where we take ghost nets and turn them into various products like sunglasses, uh, diving fins, kayaks, uh, and so on. We actually have a pair of sunglasses here. These are literally made from 100% ghost nets. So there's many things we can do as in a circular economy with the, with the waste uh, of, of fishing nets and fishing gear. Uh, unfortunately, 10% of the world's microplastics comes from fishing gear. Uh, this project is also together with Amasul, and we'll take their broken containers, which are your typical um, recycling containers, and we'll work with local artists and turn these into kind of uh, art pieces for the ports where the fishermen can discard their nets, uh, starting with the pilots in Setubal. Um, we will also work, work together with Sea Shepherd, uh, Sea Shepherd Portugal. Uh, we have a diving team where we'll go out along the coast of Portugal and clean up uh, the, the coastline from diving and, and collecting the nets. Uh, and also part of uh, Azure Impact is um, Ghost Network with together uh, as you impact jobs and doing beach cleanups and uh, forest planting. Uh, this is a future project. And also we are in development of making an app which can uh, people can detect and report the ghost nets uh, and then we can go and collect them. Uh, this will be a worldwide project. So worldwide initiatives can report on this app and basically uh, collect the nets and all different initiatives can then, you know, make an impact 
uh, ultimately cleaning up the ocean from from the nets. Um, yeah, I think that's about that about that's me. Thank you, Christopher. Um, maybe like we can have a f few questions for you before going to the next panelists and then like a conversation with all of them. But uh, first of all, you have three like uh, occupations, which is like for me a clear cut example of the future of work is also my case. <laughs> we have, as I say in Brazil, many hats uh, and going on. And uh, how do you see as we work with interns and then you have also at um, the Green Innovation Group several projects going on. What kind of skills, like uh, the young professionals that are here with us today in Portugal or watching uh, online, they should start developing if they want to land a job uh, with green innovation, on your um, opinion? Yeah, very good question. So, I mean, we, we accept all different types of backgrounds, from marketing to business development, to marine biologists, to engineers, uh, there's some amazing jobs on our platform now with the likes of Plastic Fisher, who are stopping marine waste uh, or ocean waste going to the oceans. They put these kind of bollards in the, in the rivers in Indonesia to stop the, the rubbish going into the oceans. They're looking for engineers. Then we have uh, amazing social impact companies uh, like Sapana in Portugal, for example. Um, they're amazing doing a lot with uh, the prisons and, and social impact. They're looking for marketeers. Uh, at Green Innovation Group, we always have at least three to four interns with us every six months from all over the world, especially from Portugal. We have great results from University Nova uh, and Catolica uh, and open to partnership with universities all over Portugal. That's the, the ultimate goal. Um, but we accept anyone from any background, you know, uh, myself, uh, as much as I, I did study, I, I actually left my studies and went to the British Army and then I was traveling the world. Um, so, you know, it's it really... It's really open to any kind of background. Uh, you can be an anthropologist, you can be a, a marketeer, you can be a communications expert or whatever. So there's always jobs uh, in the impact industry. Unfortunately, they're not in abundance. So a lot of them are usually internships and then potentially develop into a full-time job. Uh, but that is the ultimate goal is to, is to get the youth uh, experience so then they can go out there into the big world and, and have this experience to, to get into the market of the impact jobs. Um, right now, I will also call Nuno Brito Jorge to be with us. And I think he can complement a little bit what uh, Christopher just said, talking about the role of entrepreneurship in creating new jobs or even a lot of people, they will in, in the next decades create their own job, which is like a tendency that we are seeing. Uh, a lot of young people, they are not satisfied with their current jobs and they have an idea and there's like this ecosystem being built to help them uh, thrive and, and tested. So, uh, Nuno, if you are with us, can you tell a little more about your experience and, and how the entrepreneurship sector can also help like, bring these sustainable jobs that we are looking for? Yeah. Um, hi, first of all, thanks for, uh, for having me. Um, I hope you can hear me well. Yes. Yeah, great. Um, also nice to see you, Christopher. Um, so I, I would say that you know one thing that apparently we, we the three of us we have in, we have in common is that we we do have this uh, three hats or more than more than three hats that, that you that you mentioned and I do think it's a reflection of where things might might be going. So in in, in our case and for those who don't know who, who Go Parity what Go Parity is it's a, an um, an impact investing platform. So basically what we are trying to build is an alternative to regular banking for your daily financial services where you as a citizen or company can have your own bank account and to create your savings plans, invest in, 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 in impactful projects and in the end use the app to use money for good. So you know that you're, you are empowered to manage whatever you are doing with your with your money so from our from our perspective and thinking of of the sustainable jobs i would say that we think of them from two perspectives one is of course go parity being an, an entrepreneurship initiative um, originating the creation of of jobs 
And of course, we, we now have a team of 12 people. Um, and I was thinking about the question you asked Christopher about what kinds of, of, uh, of skills people should develop in order, in order to, be, to be hired in an impact job in the future if they want. And honestly, the way I, the way I see it is I've made a lot of good hirings and I've also made a lot of mistakes hiring. Uh, not, not, only, not only for, for Goberity, but also for Copernicu, which is a renewable energy cooperative that I, that I started in Portugal too. And in the end, I think that the most important um, um, attributes that, that we need to assure is that there is a good alignment with your own values and vision with that of the, of the company. Because you might hire the best economist or maybe the best engineer, but if for them it is the same to work in a shoe factory than it is to work in an, in an impact uh, project, then the odds are they're not going to um, um, perform to their, to their best at, at that job. Whereas when you have people that, as Christopher said, no, ma no matter what their background is, they have a full alignment with your vision and core values of the company and why you created the company, then those are the people that, that are going to excel at their at their jobs. And of course, then we have the other perspective, which is we we have so far funded more than 56 projects that are that contribute to the sustainable development goals. Um, we are already in nine countries worldwide, and all of these jobs, all of, sorry, all of these projects. They also create they also create uh, jobs, and I, I don't have exact figures for now of of, of how many jobs we have helped create uh, so far. I mean, we, we do calculate them on a, on a project basis, but I don't have the aggregate figure. I just asked maybe it will arrive while we are while we are speaking. But that's also the part where financing comes in, and of course, to be able to have affordable. Uh, Financing at fair, with fair conditions is also a uh, um, cornerstone for you to be able to actually start projects and then create those those sustainable jobs. And one of our, our one of our worries is always that projects that, that we fund they are economically sustainable too, so that we know that if if we are creating jobs and if we are creating value, we are doing that in a sustainable manner. In manner, which is also the way that we know that our people that invest through our platform will also get their interest back. And that's great. And um, I would like to ask it's a more specific question, but also impact the job um, scenario. How uh, the pandemic impact entrepreneurs in your view, like uh, not only related to jobs, but in general, because I see, and I can give the example of my own company, Youth Climate Leaders, we were able to keep our team and even hire someone else, and we did our best. This was our main priority during the, I would say, mm -hmm. turbulent times that we were in the sea without seeing anything what is happening. Whereas I see more, I have people my family that were working for like uh, rich banks and things like that and then for years and then they were fired without any consideration you know like uh, and other people got the higher salaries so how do you see that the pandemic impacted entrepreneurs but on the other side perhaps like entrepreneurs are more they are closer to their team they have more um, responsibility towards their it's like a family at least on my view yeah, yeah, it's a very, it's a very interesting question. And our actually our our relationship with the pandemics was very intense because from the from the first moment on, we were one of the first startups to 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 declare uh, I, a man mandatory remote. So we so when we did that, we did that with twenty five other Portuguese startups. And we founded uh, the Tech for COVID-19 movement in Portugal. Um, so for the first, I would say, three to four weeks of the, of the emergency state in Portugal, we had 70% of the team dedicated to fundraising to buy medical uh, hospital and medical protection equipment. So we did, we, for a while it was like, our business is not that important anymore.
because there is this huge storm coming and we need to brace for impact. Um, after, after things settled, after we, we were able to raise more than 200,000 uh, euros from 77 million, I sorry, 7,000 donors, um, after that happened, we saw, we saw, we saw that you know, a lot of funds were coming already from other sources to buy, to buy individual protection equipment. So we started to focus more on the business. And of course, I would love to tell the story that it only, it only made us stronger but we all know that it, that is not that is not the truth so the first months of the pandemic we did we did react and say guys we're all in this together the founders we we stopped earning our our wage yeah. and then and for the, the rest of the of the company uh, got 70 percent of their of their wage also free to work only 70 percent of the time of course what what happened uh, next is that while working with the with Tech for COVID movement, of course, we also got a lot of volunteers that worked with us somehow. So in the end, we also ended up hiring one one person more for, for our team. So and we and we didn't we were able to not fire anyone. One thing that has changed, I think, for for entrepreneurs is, of course, that the fear of uh, of crisis and the economic turndown. Um, made financing sources for startups, especially thinking of in investment funds, um, made it, made it easy, more difficult to, to raise funding. And we were also caught a bit in, in the middle of that. And a lot of, a lot of startups were because, you know, if you're, if you're a fund and you have a certain amount of money that you need to place, you have already invested in a number of startups, you have a pipeline of projects that you might be investing, and then suddenly there's the threat of huge crisis and things actually start uh, to go to go down for some of the companies that you have already invested in then you need to choose am i investing in new companies or am i or am i pouring down some money in the companies that i have already invested in where i already have uh, uh, um, my bets at stake and try to help them through the through the turmoil and looking at, at the graphs in our economic activity, you can see clearly that March, March was a good, good month because it was when it all started. And April and May were, were we were very low in, in activity. I mean, in the money invested through our platform. And then in June, we picked up again, July above June. August was quite low, but it's very normal to have low August because it's summer summer season and then september was our best month ever so in september we had the largest number of new users the largest uh, uh, amounts invested ever and now october is in the line to overcome september so in the end i think that maybe hopefully a few months from now we can say yes the pandemic only made us stronger because our our thesis is when people face crisis we become more aware of, of what we do with, with our money. And it was beautiful to see the reactions of a lot of people in our platform when we asked, listen, this company needs to renegotiate or to introduce a grace period because they cannot pay the full interest and capital as they were expected. We got a lot of responses of people saying, uh, yeah, of course, don't worry. This is when, this is the time now when these types of companies need us and need our, our support. But hopefully we can also become uh, um, uh, a powerful tool for people to choose the kind of projects and economy that they want to see surge after the pandemics. Uh, well, thank you, uh, Nuno. And now we are going to bring Frederick uh, with us uh, to complement everything that was said. Uh, Frederick, can you hear us? Yeah, oh, great. I hear you loud and clear. Thank you. Thank you for being with us. Thank you, Kesha. Yeah, you can talk a little more about it, how the Green Innovation Group uh, um, and the projects you have, like also are related to creating new sustainable jobs. And, and uh, Christopher mentioned a little bit about your work, but now since you are with us, I think you can also compliment. Thank you. 
Excellent, thanks. Yeah, I'll, I'll do that. Uh, first of all, thank you, Kasia, for hosting this debate, and thank you to Planeteers for putting this amazing event together. It's really impressive what you have done in such a short amount of time. Uh, and thank you, Nuno. Uh, I think it's re a really great service that you have been paying to your country and contributing to the crisis and basically putting yourself last and trying to help as much as you possibly could in, uh, in terms of the crisis that was right in front of us uh, at that time and that still is right in front of us. Uh, shortly about myself, uh, my name is Frederick and I'm the CEO of Green Innovation Group, also a co-founder. We started this company five years ago because we were seeing that the single most important mission in our lifetime is to create drawdown. Drawdown is the point in time when we are taking out more greenhouse gases from the atmosphere than we are putting into the atmosphere. Nothing has ever been more important in the story of mankind. This is a must-win battle for all of us. Luckily, green business is good business, and money makes the world go round. So there is a great opportunity for all of us here. It's estimated that the UN Sustainable Development Goals alone is a business opportunity valued at $13 trillion. So this is massive. It's a really, really, really great business case for everyone who wants to move into it. However, there has been a perception of a contradiction between having a great business case and doing something that is not harmful to the planet. And luckily, we have loads of companies like Planeteers that are promoting all of these solutions that are sustainable, that are not harming the planet, and providing a platform where these solutions can actually be purchased by the clients and the customers. So when we're talking about this massive business opportunity, we're talking about the necessity for all of us to act on it. Well, something really important comes to mind, right? And that is what are the new jobs in, in this space? And in Green Innovation Group, we have activities in more than 12 countries. And we have a platform with more than 6,000 green startups on it. Loads and loads and loads of hyper-talented people approach us in the hope that we have a job for them. And frankly, we don't hire that much. You know, we're, we're a small team based in Copenhagen and Lisbon. However, we do have access to 6,000 potential employers for these people that wish to make the transition become part of the solution rather than being part of the problem. And that's something we are looking quite deeply into, to providing a platform both for the companies to find the right talent that they need, it's one of their main challenges, but also for the talent to find a meaningful job. So um, when we're looking at the future of work, I think what, what we have been talking about today is that future of work is going to be more remote, it's going to be closer to a gig economy, as you also said, Kasia, you have three different hats on. Um, and, and that is probably going to be a tendency that we will see quite a lot. On top of that, we're going to see that everyone will be focusing more and more into niche specialities, catering to very small groups of people that they have access to through the internet. And, and this is also a very powerful notion, you know, that nerdiness can actually pay off because now with the connectivity we have in the world, you can find the five key customers that can make you make a living off of it. However, there are, of course, also a massive social um, dilemma and challenge that we need to tackle. What do we do with uh, rising unemployment when we can start automating for, for classic job functions, for instance? That's a massive challenge. And, and I, I haven't seen many really good uh, answers to this besides the universal basic income, where everyone basically receives uh, a fixed amount uh, every month just, just to be humans. And then they can do with it what they want. And I, I think that's the best solution that's out there, but it's still quite faulty. And in many states, there's no budget to do it, and there's also no governance to actually administer it. So, so we are facing a massive challenge here, because most of the time, pulling humans out of jobs will also make the, the planet more sustainable, because a lot of the jobs that we have are in positions that are highly polluting. So we need to find a way to, to actually make us uh, as a species, the ones that nurture the planet, nurture the businesses without harming the planet and without harming the businesses. 
that way we can actually have prosperity. Um, so we are seeing urbanization as another massive trend that will probably mean that the majority of the world's population will live in cities uh, and live in very few select cities as well. And, and this is, of course, both a major challenge, but it's also a major opportunity. What if we could all live in metropolitan areas where we didn't have to own cars, we will have autonomous driving electric vehicles that are not polluting, we will have vertical farms with which we can actually grow the majority of the food that is consumed inside that city. All of the sewage and the waste disposal can be distributed out into an ecosystem where it can become more food and we can have little robot harvesters that are, that are harvesting the food for the people that live inside the metropolitan areas. That is sort of my sci-fi fantasy for, for the year 2050. Um, but, but, but we do need to address what does it mean when, when we get uh, into an economy where we, are pro we are we are prioritizing access rather than ownership. What does it mean that I no longer will have to own my own car? But the car manufacturer will still need to make money. So are we actually removing the asset away from the citizen and putting it at a higher cost, at a higher risk for each individual and therefore creating inequality uh, and not creating prosperity? That, those, those are really interesting questions that, that we need to come up with good answers to. But right now, right here, right now, we do see that all the best talent in the world want to work within sustainability. All of the best performing companies in the world are addressing sustainability challenges. And we're also seeing the financial performance of sustainable assets way out competing the black assets. So, so I, I do think that the changes are coming, the changes are coming fast. The, one of the main questions is, are the changes coming fast enough on one hand? And on the other hand, are we able to actually create meaningful jobs for enough people to make the entire switch? Well, there are very good um, insights that we had today. Maybe uh, before um, we have, we'll have to thank everyone soon. But uh, Frederick, your final word about like the role and uh, how can you, f how do you think uh, everyone here can be part of this movement of for creating uh, sustainable jobs? Yeah, thanks a lot for the question, Kasia. I think that's that, that's an amazing uh, question. If only I had the answer to uh, to give you like one silver bullet, then then we would be all fixed, right? Um, I'm not sure entrepreneurship is for everyone. Uh, it can be extremely hard, extremely draining. We also know that entrepreneurs, on average, have um, uh, more psychological issues. Uh, we we entrepreneurs tend to get depressed more, we tend to get stressed more. Um, so so. Entrepreneurship is not risk-free. It's not for everyone. It can be for a lot of people, mm -hmm. but, but for that to be the case, I, I think that in, in many situations, you can also do um, way more and have a bigger impact if you can integrate into a much larger organization and then try and push from the inside, inside that organization. And I think that is probably the most feasible way for impact for most, even though it doesn't sound as sexy as uh, running your own startup or becoming an entrepreneur, you know that 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 is kind of the rock stars of of the of the um, of the teens and the twenties in in this millennia. Totally. But I think it's a pity. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you very much, uh, all of you. It was a great talk. I agree uh, with everything you said, and I hope uh, next year we will be with us here or whatever. Like it was a great day. Thank you very much.